That average is not including the... The cheaters? <laughs> no, not including the cheaters. Okay. So, last time, the end of the last class, we sort of left off looking at this circuit. That let us do addition, but let us kind of select the operands that we wanted. So, let's say it's got 4-bit bus output from the sum, it's got carry, and then a 4-bit uh, in first operand x. Turn that on. And we had some try states that let us select the other operand, right? So it was all the enables the A for A, and B for B. C for C, enable D for input D, right? And the idea here is that you could have, you know, S would equal X plus B if enable B equals one and the rest of them, enable A and enable C and enable D equal zero, right? You could pick which operand you wanted to add with X. What place in memory, spoiler alert, we're going to pull from to get our operand to add with. Now, there's a problem with this, right? And the problem is we can't have two signals. Attached on the same place, right? Because something is confusing, right? A is 1, and B is 0, and the one is the output, who knows? Right? So this is against the rules. So to make this work, we have to ensure, we have to guarantee that when able B is 1, the rest of them will be 0. Otherwise, we leave ourselves open to all kinds of terrible things happening. So to make sure that happens, we're going to use a special kind of circuit that is used for a lot of other things, too, as we'll see. And it's called a line decoder. Um, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, traditionally, we say something like this an in to 2 to the n line decoder is how we size them. So you would have a a 1 to 2, a 2 to 4, a 3 to 8, a 4 to 16, and so on. So let's take a look here, let's make it easy, at a 2 to 4 line decoder. All of the operation is the same for all of the rest of them. So 2 to 4. Line decoder. We'll have inputs, we'll just call them A and B. And our outputs we'll have as D0, D1, D2, and D3. And we lay out, like always, all the possible inputs for our input side 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And here's the special part. G0 is 1 for the first row and 0 for the rest of them. D1 is 1 for the second row here and 0 for the rest of them. And we create this diagonal line of 1s going all the way down. And this is the JITS, right? This is the entire game when it comes to line decoders, right? We're going to say that each of these outputs 
is 1 for a specific input combination and is 0 for all the rest of them. Another way we can look at it is that each of the outputs equal a certain min term. So we'd say that d0 is a function of a and b and is equal to min term 0, right? Or a prime and b prime. We'd say that d1 is a function of a and b is equal to min term 1, which is a prime and b, right? So only when that combination is true, only when that min term is met, does the output go to 1. And this has a lot of distinct advantages. Are there any questions about the gist of our decoder? Bless you. All right. So. How do we build it? There's a couple of different ways. We'll focus on the easiest way. And that is simply to just have um, an AND gate for every output, right? So our two for the coder is just four AND gates all by themselves. Now we can also flip this on its head and say instead of a diagonal line of ones, let's make a diagonal line of zero. So zero, one, one, one for D zero, and one, zero, one, one, and one, one, zero, one, 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 zero. Right? In that case, everything is inverted, right? D zero now is not equal to min term zero, it's equal to in turn zero prime. Right, you can also say that it's equal to max term zero. And what do we have to do to convert this circuit to this invert form? Add the bubbles. What's up? Add the bubbles. Exactly, add the bubbles, right? There's a number of different ways we can do it. The easiest way is, yeah, add bubbles. Make them all the edges. Cool. Now we've got an inverted decoder. There's a whole host of reasons why we might want to flip this over. So one of the distinct advantages, or one thing that we can do with a line decoder is instead of designing a circuit, let's say this. Let's say that I've got f, and it's a function of a, b, and c. It's a function of three variables, and it's the equal to the sum of in terms, let's just say 0, 3, and seven. Now we have a technique to design a circuit to do all this stuff, right? We have the truth table. We're not, we don't need a truth table. We've got the midterm expansion, so we put in the K-map, do the stuff, do the optimization, lay down the logic circuit, all as well. But if I said, we'll just build it with a line decoder, how would you do it? Here's just using three to eight. 
So what objection might someone have to you doing it this way? One extra step, but not allowing it to be. Say that again? It's a lot of extra stuff. It's a lot of extra stuff for not a lot of what you need, right? But there's a distinct advantage, right? Yeah, this is not the optimized solution, right? You got whole logic gates that aren't even used for anything. But what's the most expensive part of any engineering endeavor? Why is it what's that? Transistors. Not the transistors. Research and development. What's that? Research and development. You said vaguely, yeah, research and development. Why is research and development so expensive? A lot of trial and error. What's that? A lot of trial and error. Yeah, it doesn't make it expensive. You gotta pay people. You gotta pay people, right? Human beings like to do things like eat and pay their mortgages and go on vacation. Humans are freaking expensive, right? So if I have these guys, already in the shop, ready to go for 10 cents a piece, would I rather use that or pay you $120,000 a year to sit there for two weeks and design a perfectly optimized version of this circuit? Well, I hope. What's that? Well, I hope. Well, I hope, right? It depends on the application, right? There might be something that we're doing that needs to be optimized. But yeah, one of the sort of laws of engineering is, is never build for yourself what you can buy. Right? It will always be more expensive to make something yourself than it will be to just buy it off the shelf. So there are a lot of reasons. In fact, most of the time, it's going to be advantageous to use something like a 3 to 8 line decoder, throw some more gates down, and send it on its way. Right? No research and development required. Now, there may be applications. You know, there may be specific things that we have to do, specific sort of constraints on our design, specific reasons why we might have to optimize and do everything that way. But for general sort of run of the mill applications, just throw a decoder down. It's all good, right? Next week when you start doing your Verilog stuff, designing all these complex logic circuits, you can't just make a one single decoder module, just copy and paste it, you know, 20 different times or whatever the project is. So that's the advantage, right? It's fast and it's easy. It's not optimized, it's not efficient, but it's quick and easy and gets you a working solution. This will work and get you the output you want. And not only will it get you the output you want, but what if I said, you know, the design comes back and says, hey, they want us to add this extra bit. We need to add some functionality that is Z is equal to some of the terms. I don't know, one, three, five, and six. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna ask about the Verilog stuff. Would you also be great on efficiency? Or no? No, this isn't a computer center. Okay. Also, the compiler will be less angry. 
there's no there's no advantage. So put a pin in that the discussion for next week, right? There is no advantage to writing a Verilog module that is 20 lines versus three lines. Because it's all going to get synthesized away in a minute. Those sorts of issues are not quite the same. Okay. You don't write efficient, nobody writes efficient very well. Good. So, um, but anyway, if I want to add this, we need to add another output function. What do we do? We need to build a new circuit? Yeah, I'd say, all right, cool, let's make another OR gate. And then, um, you know, say, all right, well, we're going to take one, three, five, and six, there we go, done, right? You use the same decoder over and over again, you get different outputs, right? Suppose you do that enough times, and then you have a solution that's better than the optimized solution. Not always, though. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Let's see. I mean, you guys went a lot faster than that. Your peers at 11 o'clock. It was a long time to get there. Um, so let's take this. Let's revisit now that question that we started with, right? That adding circuit. and stuff and 
Java, C++, or Python, and stuff like that. At the end of the day, coding is just saying, you know, I said, I equal to zero one, which we know means, you know, this was, say, like our machine language, right, our assembly language instructions, and our higher level programming language, we might actually just type x plus b, right? That's equal to that. When it gets compiled, it gets compiled with something that puts i equal to zero one, right? We have our, remember, coming back to that discussion of data inputs versus control inputs, writing software is effectively just setting where your control inputs are on the processor. So, any questions about that? So, we use the decoder for a lot of things, implementing specific logic functions, controlling access to stuff. There's one last thing for O2S2. There's a circuit that we won't use a whole bunch, but you need to be aware of anyway. It's called a priority encoder. in reverse. So instead of giving us two bits and getting that four bit output, we'll give it four bits and get two bits of output. It'll kind of look like this. Let's say we've got these three, these two, these one, these sub zero. Now those are our inputs. On the output side, we'll have our Two bits here. Let's call them. Um, let's call them A and B. Now these are the bits that you'll use coming out of the encoder. But there's actually going to be another bit, a third bit, one extra bit hanging out on the side, right? So if you have a, so this is a four to two line priority encoder. goes to two, and you're only going to use these two bits, there's always going to be one extra bit. An eight to three line priority encoder will have four output bits. And the reason for that is that we start our inputs at zero, 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 zero. Let's skip to the next line. The next line is going to be one, zero, zero, zero. And then the next line, I'm going to put the 1 here and have 0, 0, 0. And we're going to draw an x there. We'll talk about y in just a second. The next row is going to be x, x, 1, 0. And the final line is going to be x, 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 1. The way a priority encoder works is it looks at whatever the right hand, the rightmost bit on the input side, and wherever that rightmost bit is, that's the midterm that gets put out, right? So it doesn't matter that we one here. There's a one and E1, the output is going to match that midterm. So that's going to be, so one, zero, zero, zero is going to be zero, zero. X, one, zero, zero is going to be zero, one. X, X, one is going to be one, zero, and the one in the rightmost bit, that should be zero, but not two, excuse me, is going to be one, one, right? So this part is your decoder in reverse. The reason for the last bit is because of this first line, which says that um, there is no one. And that's what that last bit looks for. The last bit just tells us if it's valid or not. So we have C equals zero, and these top two are don't cares. For the rest of them, C is equal to one. And all that says, this is a motif that we're going to see a lot, especially when we start talking about sequential circuits and memory elements, right? The C equals zero means that the input was invalid. Invalid input. 
So ignore whatever the apple was. Having ones here indicates that it's valid. Input. It says that, yeah, we got some numbers, we got an input that means something, that's valid, so that our output means something, so pay attention to it. Does that kind of make sense? So the important bit, like I said, is here, because that's the main sort of beast of the priority encoder. That's our decoder in reverse, but you gotta add that bit to let us know basically that this didn't happen, that we didn't get all zeros. Any questions about that? There you go. Like I said, we won't use priority encoders a ton, uh, certainly not nearly as much as often as we'll use decoders. We'll use decoders pretty much every day from now on. Um, but you just gotta be aware that they exist, so. All right. Any questions about that? All right, pat yourselves on the back. You got to that way, way faster than we did this morning. Um, so, that's all I've got for you guys today. If there are no other questions, comments, concerns, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you. Well, we're gonna talk about read-only memory. Very excited about that.